There we go. Good. All right. The title of the message this morning is The Strength of the Lord, Full Body Armor, and Abundant Prayer in the War Against Demons. The Strength of the Lord, Full Body Armor, and Abundant Prayer in the War Against Demons, Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. So as Ryan mentioned this morning, here we are at the end, at least on Sundays, of uh, our time in the book of Ephesians. What a glorious and powerfully helpful letter this is. The letter started with the most beautiful and profound explanation of our salvation from a heavenly perspective. So that's where he started in Ephesians 1, explaining to us how we've been saved from a heavenly perspective. Often we talk about it from an earthly perspective, but from a heavenly, glorious, from the perspective of how God saved us and what he did to do it and when he started and and how he redeemed us through Christ and sealed us with his spirit, we get this beautiful, profound, I hope you know it, I hope some of you have memorized it, Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. If you haven't, I recommend you do. This profound, beautiful, explanation of how we have been saved, we who are the church, have been saved from a heavenly perspective. How we who are in Christ, how we who are in Christ, we who have been born again, we who have repented of our sins and live by faith in Jesus, God has revealed to us, think about that. God has revealed to us. He didn't have to, but he did, and so it must be useful and helpful to us. God has revealed to us how he has saved us. That's profound. Beautiful. I hope you know it and love it. He even has revealed to us in those verses why he has saved us. That we are saved simply because God loves us. And out of his great love with which he loved us, In love, the Father chose us before the world was created. In love, Jesus died to redeem us while we were yet sinners. And God loves us so much that he will never let us go. So he sealed us with his very spirit. I hope this is not only true for you. I hope this is true for you. I hope you believe this gospel good news. With all your heart, I hope you believe this gospel good news. I hope you do not push back against it or doubt these truths about our salvation because God has revealed it to us because he loves us. And y'all, that's grace. That's what grace is. A God who would save us due to nothing about us or nothing we did to earn it other than he loves us. Oh, the assurance there is in knowing it is God alone who saves. But we also know something else from this letter. We know that at one time, every single one of us, every single one of us, some of us, some of us, when we were young, some of us very recently, And for some of you, maybe still, but we know the theological truth that at one time, everyone is following the devil. Everyone. Dead in our sins, following the ways of the world, mostly deceived, not knowing we're following the devil, yet following the devil and headed to eternal wrath. Everyone. But God saves us By grace, in Christ, by giving us the gift of faith. Amen? Then what does God do? Well, we saw what God does is he calls us out of the darkness. We were in the darkness following the devil. He calls us out of the darkness, into the light, to live in the light, to do the good works he's prepared for us beforehand. We know now the mystery of salvation that has been revealed to us that we who were once Gentiles, we who were once Gentiles with no hope and no God, now have a Lord and God. 
Our Lord Jesus reconciled us to the God of heaven and earth completely and fully. And Jesus, in the word of God, then through Paul, tells us, well, then how do we live? What does it mean then to live in the light? What does it mean to come out of the darkness and live in the light? Well, Paul tells us in chapters 4 through 6. Starting in chapter 4, he says, if, if you now have the Spirit in you, you will walk in the light, you'll walk away from sin, out of the darkness, into the light, away from sin, and he started with, you will have unity in the body. A unified, loving church, you will be unified with a body member of God's people, his church, you will walk in love and walk away from sin. For, Ephesians 5, for at one time you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. So walk in it, in the light, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. What's the opposite? Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. No part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead, expose them. Which is what Paul's doing for us today. Expose them. That is the Christian life. Oh, that the church in our day would live this way. What a radical shift. We should not only be different from the world, we should be radically different from the world, even shining so brightly by the way that we live that it exposes those who are still living in darkness. They cannot live in darkness when they are around us because we are so shining so brightly they either need to get out of the darkness or flee. Expose them. And then Paul goes on to say, if you're living in the light filled with the Spirit, here's what that's going to look like in some super practical ways. Those who are living in the light, filled with the Spirit, should live this way as followers of Jesus. Since Jesus has saved you, he says, first, be filled with the Holy Spirit and sing. Sing. Ephesians 5, 18 and 19. You are filled with the Spirit, so don't live like the world. Instead, what does he say next? Instead, walk in the light, filled with the Spirit. What does that look like? Seems really simple and practical, but this is what he's saying. If you're walking in the light, not in the darkness, if you're filled with the Spirit, if if the Holy Spirit of God has sealed you, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for it is right. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in the integrity of your heart as to Christ. So if you want simple, the simple Christian life, focus on the things of Ephesians 4 through 6. Start there. Do those. Walk in the light. Turn from the darkness. Be filled with the Spirit. By being unified and part of a local church. Turn from sin. Live out God's order in your household. Simple. Yet, many who call themselves Christian do not do or even believe these powerful basics of the Christian faith. Why? Why? Demons. That's Paul's answer. What keeps people from living this way? Demons. Remember, this is how we walk in the light and not in darkness. We often see people, even people who call themselves Christian, not living in these ways, ignoring these truths, and we think, maybe that's an option, maybe maybe it's not a big deal. Paul says, no, it's demons. This is a big deal. This is how he ends this letter. If you don't see, that's what he's saying. This transition seems weird, right? Here's how to live in the household, demons. This is his final call to this church in Ephesus that he loves. He knows these people. 
He spent a lot of time here. And so, church, God's word is about to give us some deep spiritual motivation to walk in the light in these simple truths of the Christian faith in our households as the church being unified and singing to the Lord. Simple, but beautiful. Simple, but demon crushing. Here is motivation for wives to submit in everything to their husbands and motivation for husbands to love their wives and wash them in the word and motivation for children to obey their parents and motivation for fathers to bring their children up in the church and motivation for slaves to obey their masters. Motivation to do all these things. Do all these things. Why? Because we must walk in the light and not in the darkness. And to not do those things is to walk in the darkness. Whether in the church or not. Those who do not walk in the light will experience judgment, Romans 2. And the demons want us in the darkness. So we are at war. Demons want us in the darkness with them. So we are at war. It is often said that people live differently during wartime than during peace. Well, church, it's not whether or not we are at war. It's whether or not we know it and will choose to live like it. So Paul ends this letter with a reminder, a truth. He reveals another mystery to us, pulls off the blinders, telling us we are always, always at war against demons. And you might be saying, demons, what do demons have to do with all this? Open to our text for this morning, Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Demons, therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication, To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that the words may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. God's word to us, his church, this Lord's day. Finally, do you see the word finally? Finally. So all of what we have seen is true and super important, even the stuff that in some ways seems like basic living, true, super important. We need to do these things. We need to live this way. We need to teach these things in the church. But here is a final truth that will determine if we live in this victory. Here's a truth that will determine if we have victory in these things, if we walk in the light or in the darkness. Finally, truth number one, we are saved by God's power to live by God's power. We are saved by God's power to live by God's power. Finally, verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. 
So not only is it the Lord that saves, the Lord that chooses, the Lord that decides, the Lord that redeems, the Lord that seals, the Lord that keeps. It is also his strength by which we walk. It is his strength by which we live. It is his strength by which we battle and win the war. Where does our power come from? How do we live in victory? How do we overcome sin, guilt, and shame? How do we even, as we're about to see, how do we overcome demons? Well, here we get a command to start this part of the text, and we get the power to do the command. We get a command, and then we get to know where we get the power to do that command. Command, you, be strong in the Lord. Church, be strong in the Lord. How? In the strength of his power. Be strong in the Lord. Even in these things we've seen, be strong in the Lord. The world is going to hate them. Demons don't want you to live this way. Be strong in the Lord. How? His power. His might. Demons want us to live like the world. Demons want us to fit in with the world. Demons want us to be weak. Demons want us to think we have no power. But God has now shown us, here's how you walk in the light. So, be strong in the Lord. Don't waver. Be strong in the Lord. How are we going to do that? Especially against demons? In the strength of his might. In the strength of his might. Does anyone remember where Paul used those words in the strength of his might before? Ephesians 1. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power? There it is, power, toward us. His power toward us who who believe according to what? The working of his great might. Same thing. The working of his great might that he worked in us. That he worked in Christ, toward us, in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. In other words, Jesus rose from the dead, y'all. That's my paraphrase. Jesus rose from the dead, y'all. Jesus is alive. Jesus is ruling the earth from the heavenly places. And by God's strength, he gives that power to us. Do you believe that? Hear me say this. God is working immeasurable resurrection power toward us who believe when we live in his power. Let me say it again. God is working immeasurable resurrection power in and through you who believe when you live in his power. So we should do that. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. His power towards us. How do we do that? Well, first we must stand firm. Truth number two, we must stand firm. I'm going to read the whole thing. We'll go through this text a couple times, but this time I want you to look for stand firm. In the text, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand firm having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate plate of righteousness. So we'll come back to the armor of God. But so far we've seen we need God's power to live for God. He gives that power to us when we rely upon him. But what is Paul specifically saying when he says, y'all remember, you're going to need God's power. What's he talking about? Power to do what? Why does he tell us that? Why does he say, finally, remember, you need God's power to live this way. What's he thinking of? Well, he's thinking 
that if we don't live by God's power, we will fall for the schemes of the devil. That's what he's saying. If we don't live by God's power, we will fall for the schemes of the devil. See it in verse 11. That you may be able to stand. Rely on God's power so that you may be able to stand. Verse 13. That you may be able to withstand. Verse 13 again. Stand firm. Verse 14. Stand therefore. He's trying to make a point, right? He said it four times. Why is it such a big deal that Paul says, finally... Y'all are going to need God's power to live this way. It might seem simple. You're going to need God's power to live this way. You're going to need God's power to walk in the light and not return to the darkness. You're going to need God's power to stand. To withstand. To stand firm. Therefore, stand. Let me ask you, what's the opposite of standing? Standing. Falling. We remember earlier in the book, we saw there are two options. Two options. Everyone is either following Jesus or following the devil. Two options. No neutral ground. Anyone not obviously living for King Jesus is following the devil. Now we see there are two options again. We either will stand or we will fall. We will either stand or we will fall. Well, why would we fall, we, we should ask? Why would we fall? Because we're in a battle. We're wrestling. I want you to imagine a wrestling match. Because I think what we need to ask right now is, do we even know that we're in a wrestling match against demons for our souls? Do we know that? Do we live that way? We are in a wrestling match, a battle against demons for our souls and the souls of those in our life, those that we love, those that we see at the grocery store, those in the street. We are in a battle, always, against demons in a wrestling match for our souls. I want you to imagine a minute a wrestling match. The person on this side is super strong, and this person, you can just tell in their face, they really want to win. They want to crush the other side. They want to crush the other guy. Okay, that's one side. On the other side is a guy who doesn't even know he's in a wrestling match. And then the ref says, go. What's going to happen to the person that doesn't know he's in a wrestling match? At the very least, he's going to fall. Church, we're wrestling. We don't get to choose if we are or not. We're in a battle. The devil would rather you not be in the game, rather not know you're in a game, rather not fight. The devil loves the lazy river version of the Christian church, loves it. Because we must stand or we will fall. So now we ask who are we wrestling for our souls? And then we'll ask, well, then how will we stand? So next, who are we wrestling, and then how do we stand? Well, who's the battle against? Demons. Truth number three. Demons are real. They hate us. We either actively fight them, or we will fall with them. Demons are real. They hate us. We either actively fight them or we will fall with them. If you imagine back to that wrestling match we were imagining where one person was really strong and really wanted to win and the other one didn't even know they were fighting, I'm going to add something to the one who's really strong and really wants to win. They would rather die than lose. They actually know they're going to die and want you to die with them. Ephesians 6, 11 and 12. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Notice Paul says 
we do not fight against flesh and blood, but we do fight against demons. There's no qualifier here. He doesn't say, sometimes we don't fight against flesh and blood, but sometimes we do fight against demons. Sometimes we don't. Maybe always, it feels like we do, but we're not always fighting against demons. No. We don't fight against flesh and blood, but we do. Active, present, always fight against demons. We are in a battle for our souls and the souls of other. Eternity in heaven or hell is what is on the line, and the fight is against the devil's powerfully deceptive, tricky schemes being carried out by demons. Just to make something clear, I'm going to ask, well, how do these demons work? Schemes, tricks, deception, and often, mostly, through people. Demons work through people. And that's why he has to remind us, remember, it's not, they're tricked, they're your enemies, they're evil, but that's not ultimately who you're fighting. Because we remember, anyone not living by faith in Jesus, anyone not, this is why this is so important, anyone not living, living by faith in Jesus is tricked, deceived, and is following the devil. And the devil doesn't walk around giving out horns and red suits to everyone who follows him. He would rather everyone who's following him look like a normal, everyday person. Everyone is either following Jesus, living for him by faith, or following the devil. And most of them do not know they are following the devil. Would outright deny it. And yet they have fallen for the deceptive schemes of the devil. How does the devil work? The devil works through deceived pastors, false teachers, through deceived political leaders, through deceived singers. Deceived actors, deceived news anchors, deceived doctors, deceived witches. All witches are deceived. But also, maybe your deceived family member. Or your neighbor. Many who are deceived by the devil even claim and might truly think they are Christian. But the devil works through anyone who is not following Jesus as their Lord by faith. Everyone else is part of the deceptive schemes of the devil that we see here we are called to not fall for, yet to stand. So Paul is revealing something here to us. This is another mystery revealed, which means we are to know it. This battle we are in is much, much bigger than we see with our eyes. We see a glimpse of this in 2 Kings 6. I'm not going to go over that right now, but you can go read it later if you want. This battle we are in is much bigger than what we see with our eyes. Yet, we must see it. It has now been revealed to us. The blinders are off. And we either know we are in a fight and know how to fight, or we will not stand firm and we will fall. I want you to take note here for a second. Because he says this is not against flesh and blood, even though we've seen now it, it's through flesh and blood, but not ultimately against those who are flesh and blood, but against demons, because he says that, that doesn't excuse the people. No one will stand before God the judge and say, God, you shouldn't send me to hell. I know I lived a life of sin. I know I lived for myself in selfishness and not for others. I know I was like the world and celebrated evil. I know I never truly lived by Jesus in faith and my religion was fake, but God, you should save me anyways because the demons made me do it. No. The Bible makes very clear they are without excuse. And that's why this is such a big deal. The word of God here is opening our eyes to something much larger than we can see with our physical eyes. We are in a battle for souls and the souls of others, and the battle is demonic. We don't get to avoid this battle. It's not whether or not we believe in demons. They would rather you not believe in them. 
They don't want you to know what you now know from the word of God. They don't want the church to talk this way or talk about it or expose this or reveal it to you. But praise God, now we know. And we must stand firm because of these rulers, authorities, cosmic powers over this present darkness and these spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places because they want us in hell with them. But we know something. We have a promise, y'all. We know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Don't forget the first half of that. Yes, the whole world right now is in the power of the evil one. But we are from God. And so the battle lines have been drawn at this point in the word of God. The battle lines have been drawn. It is the church. Here are the battle lines. Here are the teams. The church and our God. The whole world under the power of the devil. We must know that. We must know that. Demons hate the truths we've just seen. It is no coincidence that Paul lists these things that the world is fighting against. A godly view of marriage, headship, submission, fathers. All these things we've seen, it is no coincidence. Those things to us might seem simple. It is no coincidence that after telling us about those things, Paul's like, the demons are coming. That's where they're going at. That's where they're going to trick you. That's where they're going to deceive you. Do not be deceived. Stand firm in these things. Why? Because demons absolutely hate those truths Paul has just prevented to us, presented to us. Hate them. Demons hate that God chose us. Demons hate that Jesus redeemed us when he rose again. Demons hate that the Holy Spirit has sealed us and they have no power over us. Demons hate unity in the church. Demons hate when we turn from sin and have victory over it. Demons hate wives who submit to their husband. You want motivation for that? The demons hate it. Demons hate husbands when you love your wives. Demons hate marriage because demons hate headship. Demons hate submission. Demons hate the gospel. So demons hate marriage. Demons hate obedient children. Demons hate fathers who train up their children in the Lord. Demons hate when there are more warriors for this battle. Demons hate when slaves obey their masters. Demons hate all of these things because this is how we walk in the light and take dominion. This is how we win the war. Demons, real, spiritual, actual demons, real beings, hate us. They're after our souls. They want us to fall. They don't want us to stand firm. They want us to disobey God because they hate God. So then what do demons love? Demons love disunity in the church. Demons love when we stay in sin or return to it. Demons love when wives try to rule over their husbands. Demons love when husbands do not love their wives or wash them in the word. Demons love marriages that are a false picture of Christ in the church turned upside down without a head. Demons love when children are disobedient. Demons love fathers who do not discipline their children or bring them up in the Lord. Demons love when masters are disobeyed. Demons love all of these things because this is how demons win this battle or at least think they are winning. By keeping us in the darkness. Demons especially love these things when people who call themselves Christian do not live by God's ways. Because they hate the kingdom of God. Demons love false or weak or lukewarm churches. Demon lo demons love when people say they follow Jesus and live like the world. Demons love false teachers. Demons love, love, love. When we say, it's okay to live like that, everyone else is doing it. What's the big deal if we don't live by God's ways? Because that is the scheme of the devil. That might be the ultimate scheme of the devil. Think back to the garden. This is the tactic he's been using since the first man and woman. Did God really say? Do you want to know better than God? 
What's a little disobedience or twisting of the word? You can even be your own God. That's the scheme of the devil, and we must stand against it. This is a constant battle against demonic forces, actual demons. I keep saying that on purpose. The battle for the minds of our children against woke socialism and evil sexuality is a battle not against flesh and blood or government, but against demons. The battle for your marriage is a battle against demons. The battle for unity in this church is a battle against demons. Yes, demons work through humans, even entire human institutions. Anyone or anything that is not truly Christian is working for the demons. Schools that deceive with evolutionary theory taught as truth and the truth of creation taught or ignored as theory. This is the teaching of demons. News media convincing everyone on every channel that you can see a man in a dress with long hair and call him a woman. Even calling him by his newly chosen girl name and referring to this man as she, this is the teaching of demons. Millions upon millions of people spending most of their day filling their eyes and ears with the teaching of demons using their smartphones. This comes from Hollywood and Washington, from news media and our neighbors, from social media and entire societies the teaching of demons. And even from many pulpits. As Jesus told us what happened in Revelation 2, seeing the teaching of this demonic woman Jezebel would spread her teachings throughout the church, when in reality what she was teaching, Jesus calls the deep things of Satan. Revelation 2. This is the reason Jesus calls false teachers sons of the devil, and Paul says false teachers should be a curse to hell. We are in a battle against demons for our souls and the souls of others, and for souls, yes. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, lion seeking someone to devour. He's not just in a wrestling match. Remember, demons use deception. Demons attack the weak. Demons find our weaknesses or areas where we're in sin and attack. This is another reason to be a part of a strong biblical church where you are known and loved, or else you are like a baby deer being stalked like a lion. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Do not underestimate the power of these demons. And yet, church, we have a sweet and powerful promise that we can walk in victory. We can know we are in this battle and yet be in the battle with no fear if you are in Christ. If you are not in Christ, this is a fearful battle. If you are in Christ, we are walking from victory because we have Jesus. And our God disarmed the rulers. Disarm them. They have no weapons. They can deceive, but they have no ultimate weapons. They've been disarmed. He's triumphed over them in Christ. Victory is ours. We should see this and have fear. This is fearful. And yet because we fear God, there is no true fear. We have victory, y'all. We have victory. We win. There is no doubt. Jesus has triumphed over them. He disarmed the rulers and authorities, putting them to open shame by triumphing over them in Christ. Amen? When we know we are in a battle and then rely upon the Lord for his strength, and we see that it's a battle against demons, what do we do next? How do we stand firm, withstand the blows, stand, therefore? How do we do that? We put on God's armor. Paul said it this way in Romans 13, 12. The night is far gone. 
The day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. And now Paul tells us what that means here in Ephesians. Truth number four, we need full body armor from God or we will fall. We need full body armor from God or we will fall. Verses 13 through 17, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Don't leave a part out and run into battle. We'll see at the end. Don't forget your helmet. Take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, how? Having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, the battle is always, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all, did you see that? All the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We must stand. But stand doesn't mean just stand there. It means stand firm, be active in battle, and you will not fall. And since we are up against supernatural, demonic forces, we cannot rely upon our own human strength. Even human armor will not win this war. We must be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might and put on the whole armor of who? God. So what does it look like to be strong in the Lord? How do we put on this armor? How do we rely upon his strength? Notice you see throughout here, we actively take up, put on. This isn't passive. They are disarmed. We have a weapon of offense at the end. This is an offensive battle. We're on offense. So what is the armor of God and how do we take it up and put it on? How will you withstand the devil and stand firm until the end? Well, first, we must put on the belt of truth. We must put on the belt of truth. Why? The enemy's current tactic is schemes, deception. The enemy is going to flood us with lies. Flood us with lies especially the lie that we can be right with God and live however we want. Flood us with lies. So when the enemy comes at you or your family, your children, your wife, your friends, your neighbor, anyone in this church, when the enemy comes at us with lies, trick, deception, schemes, did God really say, does that really mean Lies about salvation. Lies about how to be saved. Lies about how to live as a Christian. Lies about the gospel. Lies about where our identity and worth come from. The lie that there are many ways to heaven. The lie that we must do something to earn our salvation. Or the lie that you can have salvation without repentance and faith. Any lie, every lie, all lies, how do we stand God's truth. There's one truth. It is from the Lord. He has given us the truth. And so we have a truth. If you look at the armor, this this belt is what held up the rest of the armor. You can do all the other things. And if it's false teaching, you don't have a belt on. You don't have a belt on, your pants fall down. You got no place to put your sword. When the world or the visible church changes their truth every few months, or the devil comes at you or your family with questions and lies, church, we have one hope of protection from those lies, and it is the truth as found in God's holy word. God's word is truth. Next, we put on the breastplate of righteousness. What does this mean? Well, first, I'll get to it in a minute, but what is a breastplate? Where does it go? Right here. What does it protect? 
your vital organs, your heart, your lungs. Don't go into battle without this. What is righteousness being spoken of here? Well, first and foremost, first and foremost, we must know where our righteousness comes from, from Christ. If you've put your faith in Christ and live by faith in Christ, you are righteous. When the devil tells you otherwise, you are righteous in Christ. You call him a liar and tell him to go. We're back to where he came from. Tell him to flee from you. Jesus is our righteousness. By faith, we are righteous. We stand firm in that truth. And we will one day stand before God and be called righteous because we have put on Christ. He is our righteousness. Romans 8, 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When demons come at you with accusations, stand firm in Jesus. He is your righteousness. But there's a putting on of righteousness that also happens for those who have put on Christ. When Jesus becomes our righteousness, we begin to live out his righteousness. We begin to live out his perfection. His righteousness becomes our power to live righteously. So we put on the righteousness of Christ in our justification, and therefore no one can accuse us, even the devil. But then we live out the righteousness of Christ in our sanctification. Becoming holy. And when we know that, we won't be tricked by the devil when he comes with those temptations. No, I'm going to be like Jesus, my righteousness. And that kind of righteousness protects our hearts from the attack of demons. Forgetting your righteousness, your breastplate of righteousness, opens your heart to attack. Living unrighteously in the darkness opens your heart to attack. James says it this way. Submit yourselves to God. See that? Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. That's a promise. It's a promise. Submit to God's ways. Resist the ways of the devil. He'll flee. He'll go somewhere else. We need to put on shoes. Shoes that make us gospel ready because of the gospel of peace. Shoes that make us gospel ready because of the gospel of peace. This one is super powerful. can't even count the number of times either I or one of y'all or somebody in Bible study say, I had an opportunity, but I didn't take it, and now I'm upset. I don't know why I didn't take it. I, I knew I should have said something, but I didn't do it. You're going to get a key right here. Because if you put on all your armor, and then the war comes, and your shoes aren't on, and you aren't ready, you're still going to fall. So how does the gospel make us ready for the attacks of demons and the opportunity to speak the gospel? How does the gospel make us ready for that? Well, the gospel gives us peace. And it is in that peace that at any circumstance we bring the peace, the gospel of peace to others. We saw this actually on Wednesday. Harlan read it. Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet. There they are, feet of him who brings good news, who publishes what? Peace. See where Paul's pulling this from? Who brings the good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. And if our God reigns, we can have peace. So what does it look like to be ready to walk in the gospel? What does he mean here? It means we are ready at all times to speak the gospel to anyone. You're ready to speak the gospel to anyone, everyone, even if the devil is standing in front of you. You're ready to speak the gospel, or maybe more difficult than the devil standing in front of you. Speak the gospel to a family member who's in sin. Speak the gospel to your friend, your coworker, someone at the grocery store. In this battle we're in, if we're not ready to speak the gospel, when the time comes, 
we won't speak the gospel. And so how do we be ready? What are these shoes we put on? How are we going to be ready to save people from the grasp of demons when the time comes and we get the opportunity to tell them the gospel? How are those words going to actually come out of our mouth in those moments? In the midst of the battle for the eternal souls of others. We know faith comes from hearing, so we must speak. And the demons want us to never be ready to speak. So what aspect of the gospel will get us ready to speak the gospel at all times, in all circumstances, with no fear? What aspect of the gospel that makes us ready to speak it without fear? Peace. Why peace? Why is it peace that is missing when we miss opportunities or we're not ready when the gospel opportunity comes? Why is it peace that was missing when we let fear overcome us? Because if you have peace in your heart, Think about this. If you have peace in your heart because you know God has saved you and you know Jesus is your Lord and you know he's going to win this victory and you know in the battle against demons you have resurrection power. If you walk around all day in that peace, if that's what's in your heart, if you're living in the light and not in the darkness, you're just that peace with God's power, his ways, his order, his salvation. He has saved you. You know it. We're going to win this victory. The demons won't win. If that's the peace in your heart, you will walk around ready to tell others the gospel of peace and be ready for every opportunity. When opportunity comes, the devil will have no power to stop you from speaking because you will already be at peace. So walk in the gospel of peace. We must take up the shield of faith or we will get hit by fiery darts. We must take up the uh, the shield of faith or we will get hit by fiery darts. So here we go. Now the attack is coming. These attacks of demons are called fiery darts of the evil one. The attack is coming. We better be ready. We better have a powerful defensive weapon to block these attacks. It says we will block all of the darts. We should not constantly be walking in weakness. We can block all of the darts if we have this shield. Why were the darts fiery? Because they were meant to start shields on fire. So then there would be no shields. The shield he's thinking of here was large enough to protect the whole body. Kind of looked like a door. It was often dipped in water or covered in, covered in leather, so fire would not be effective against it. That's what he's thinking here. And what is this shield that makes all of the arrows of the devil effective in our life? This is important. We want this. What is this shield? Faith. Faith. Faith in who? God. This is why I love reading the Psalms and the way we're reading them on Wednesdays, because that Yahweh God is our God. He doesn't lose. This is faith that Yahweh is our God, and he will win the battle, and he will keep us from falling. Why? Because he is our shield. Psalm 144, 1 and 2. Blessed be the Lord, Yahweh, my rock, who trains my hands for war. He trains my fingers for battle. He is my steadfast love and my fortress. He is my stronghold and my deliverer. And then it says this, he is my shield. In he in whom I take refuge. And what does he do as our shield? He subdues peoples under me. In this battle against demons, we will not and cannot win on our own. We will go down in flames. The attacks will hit us every time. If God does not protect us as our shield, but by faith in the one true God, we cannot be hit. If you're being hit, pick up your shield. 
When our faith is in God and the enemy comes at us with lies and accusations, when the tiry fu- fiery tongues of gossip or the fiery dart of persecution comes at us, God is our shield. We don't need to defend ourselves when we live by faith in the God who will one day cast all of these demons and all who follow them into the lake of fire. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers, reference here, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything in all of creation including demons will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? The shield of faith in Jesus Christ our Lord and God John says it this way, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. We must take the helmet of our salvation. Okay, now imagine this armor. We're at this point now. The the victory is about to happen. Where is the one place we could still take a fatal blow? What body part? Our head. This one is so critical for all of us and especially important for some of you to hear. I'm going to say something simple but powerful here. I want want it to sink in. If you have on all of this armor, but in your mind you are not absolutely sure that you are saved, if you have on all of this armor and do all of these things, but in your mind you are not absolutely sure that you are saved, then you are open to an attack of the devil upon your mind. And he will crush your assurance. In a world of so-called Christian deconstruction, which is an oxymoron, doesn't even make sense, with many walking away from the faith, with many obviously deciding to do Christianity their own way, we know they are those who never truly had faith, But what is it about knowing for sure you are saved by God and not yourself? What is it about knowing for sure in your mind that you are saved by God and not yourself that protects your mind and your assurance? What is it? Simply put, if you know and understand salvation as described in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, and you know for sure that that is for you, it's talking about you, then you have on the helmet of salvation. That's what Paul's saying. The mystery of salvation that I've revealed to you in this letter, he's saying, the mystery of that salvation, if you've repented of your sin and lived by faith in Jesus, who died, died to redeem you of your sin, you've been sealed by the Spirit. Period. If you believe that you are saved because God did it all, If you believe he chose you even before you were born, he sent his son to die for you while you were yet a sinner, he gave you the gift of faith, and when you heard the gospel and believed, he sealed you with his Holy Spirit, and you will live with him forever because he did all of that for you. If you believe that in your mind, you have on the helmet of salvation. That protects your assurance in your mind. There is no full assurance in any other gospel. If there's an ounce of you in your salvation, fiery darts will go after that ounce. If you think God chose you because you decided to choose him, you are a helmetless helmetless soldier. But if you know your salvation is absolutely certain, that you are saved because God saved you, because God loves you, and Christ did every single part of your redemption, then your mind is protected from the devil, from any false gospel, and you will stand in the evil day. Psalm 140, verse 7, O Lord, my Lord, the strength of my salvation, you have covered my head in the day of battle. And finally, it's time to go on offense. We must take with us the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. 
It is time now, church, to put some demonic schemes to death. In the words of John Kelvin, By faith we repel all the attacks of the devil, and by the word of God the enemy himself is slain. By faith we repel all the attacks of the devil, and by the word of God the enemy himself is slain. Amen? The sword here is meant for attack. This is the kind of sword they would use for hand-to-hand close combat. We notice here that the word of God, when spoken, the word of God, when spoken from our mouths or written, the word of God is our sword. Without the word of God, you are in a battle without a weapon. Without the word of God, it's like being in an alley, a dark alley, about to do a knife fight, and you reach in your pocket and there's nothing there what it's like living life without the word of God. The word of God is our sword. We use the word of God to free people from the enemy's control. We use the word of God to attack the devil's schemes, which we're about to see. We use the word of God to cut down the enemy's attacks. 2 Corinthians 10, 4-6. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but our weapons, the word of God, the sword, Our weapons have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. So we use the word of God, and when we use the word of God, not our own words, not our own logic, the word of God, when we use the word of God, we do so with the divine power of God. When we use the word of God as our weapon in this war, we do so with godly power. Human words have human power. The word of God has godly power. Do you understand how powerful it is to have the word of God in your mind? Do you understand how powerful it is to have the word of God ready in your mind that you may speak the word of God into any situation? How powerful is that? Divinely powerful. When you use the word of God to destroy the lies of this age, when you use the word of God to destroy the lies of this age, you are spitting daggers. Let me ask you, why do we give so much time and emphasis to teaching and preaching the word of God at Revival Church? Because without it, we have no divine power to destroy any stronghold. And we will be tricked by the devil's schemes. There is no winning without any offense. What are these strongholds that are spoken of here? Spiritual strongholds. Demons holding people's feet to the fire with false beliefs. Demons keeping people on the wide road to destruction. And the people walk all the way to hell deceived, thinking they were walking to heaven. These are demonic strongholds. Demonic strongholds telling people men are women and women are men and love is love and homosexuality is to be celebrated. Demonic strongholds telling us that babies can be removed from women's bodies like they're an appendix. Demonic strongholds telling us that we can do marriage how we want, not how God says. Demonic strongholds telling us that headship is abuse and submission is weakness. Demonic strongholds that tell people that because they say they believe in God or go to church or got baptized, now they can live however they want. Demonic strongholds. Demonic strongholds that cause people to ask the question, did God really say? Demonic strongholds that capture people who once seemed to have faith and now live like the world and are stuck in sin. Demonic woke strongholds from every corner and every institution. How do we destroy these demonic strongholds? We destroy them by speaking the truth from the word of God on offense as a sword. Our sword in this battle against demons for our souls and against them for the eternal souls of those we love, our sword in the battle is God's word. We use the word of God to free people from being captive to demonic false teachings and make them captive to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen?
Truth number five, the armor of God is for all of life and all of the time. You'll see here he says, in all circumstances. You'll see here he describes it as clothing, as battle for the, for the war. To not have these on at some point is like being in a war with no armor on. So when you are getting dressed, when you are walking, in all circumstances, when you are thinking, when you are talking, when you are reading the Bible, you never know when a flaming dart is coming at you. For those who are bow hunters, bow hunters wait. They're quiet. They don't want the deer to hear or know that an arrow is coming until it is too late. The demons have their bows drawn and arrows ready to fire. This is why when you fall into sin, some of you know what I'm, I'm about to say here. You've been through this even recently. When you fall back into sin, it all of a sudden seems like everything gets worse. You start believing lies. The same thing happens if you make a kingdom advance. You make an advance for the kingdom. What happens? Attack comes. So we're to always have on our protective armor and never be without our sword, the word of God. You should come on Sundays and come on Wednesdays planning to seriously sharpen your sword. And you should always be carrying the word of God. And primarily in your heart and in your mind, and most of you have a phone with the word of God on it, so you are always carrying. So at this point, Paul's super fired up. I kind of am too, but at this point, Paul is super fired up when he gets to this next part. And you can tell Paul all of a sudden starts to pray or speak in a certain way when he's fired up. And he does it here. Truth number six. We must always pray in the spirit for power as we say, stay in power. In prayer, sorry. See, I'm fired up. We must always pray in the spirit for power as we stay in prayer. Always pray and stay in prayer in the spirit. Verse 18. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. He basically says pray four times. Pray with all prayer, supplication, make supplication. Let's simply look at what the word says here. Pray at all times in the spirit. Pray at all times in the spirit. So when? At all times. How? In the spirit. And then he says, I'm going to come back to that, but then he says, pray with all prayer. Just think about that for a while. If you figure out exactly what that means, come and tell me. Pray with all prayer. It almost sounds like it means you should be prayerfully praying. And then he says, supplication and making supplication. So pray for others. Always. Pray for others. So we should ask, okay, Paul, so how do I pray with prayer? And I think he would say, pray always with all of your prayers prayerfully while you are always praying. See what I mean? It seems like he's so fired up about us praying now that he just can't stop saying it. Pray prayerfully always. Just keep praying. For everyone, each other. Pray for each other. Why? Because this is serious business, standing firm or falling. This fight is against demons. So it's like, y'all, you, you just need to pray always with prayer. This battle is going to require prayer because otherwise you won't stand firm. People will fall before your eyes. So pray and pray for them. Always pray in the spirit. For there to be unity in the church and for us to turn from sin and grow in holiness, we're going to need to be praying. For you to take your marriage and your role in it seriously with gospel seriousness. 
you're going to need to be praying. For you dads to stand up in this culture and discipline your children and bring them up in the Lord, we're going to need to be praying. For your children to obey your parents, we need to be praying for you and you need to be praying. And yet we have God's power in us to win this battle. So when we pray for those things, he hears us and he answers us. So we should pray out of necessity and with excitement and anticipation. Which is part of what it means to pray in the Spirit. But I think he means more than that when he says pray in the Spirit. I think he means more than pray by the Spirit, by the way. Yes, for sure, the Spirit is our helper in prayer. Yes. But it's more than that. The Spirit is in us. Be in tuned to the Spirit as you pray in the Spirit. So how do we pray at all times in the Spirit? I'm just going to give you one way to put this into practice, that we pray all times in the Spirit. Well, first, follow the Holy Spirit in the day-to-day of your life. If you're in sin or in darkness, you're not going to hear the Spirit or pray in the Spirit. So follow the Holy Spirit in the day-to-day of your life. Be tuned into the Spirit. Quiet your life down so you can hear the Spirit. Don't always be listening to something or thinking of other things. Quiet your heart. And then, when you do that, something's going to happen. The Spirit's going to bring something to your mind. Pray about it. The Spirit's going to bring someone to your heart. Pray for him. Pray for her. The Spirit might bring someone into your life. Pray for them prayerfully. You might think about a family member. Pray for her. You might run into someone at the grocery store. Pray for him. Out of nowhere, someone you barely know or haven't seen in years comes to your mind. What do you do? Pray. Maybe put a morning reminder on your phone that says, I'm going to pray all day in the spirit for everything. And then just do it. And over time, we will pray in the Spirit, in everything. And one of the ways God will motivate this is because he's going to answer some of those prayers. And be like, I don't even know why I prayed for that person, and now look what happened. And God's going to get all the glory, like he should. And then Paul pr- says supplication, and he says it twice. Which means we need to pray for one another a lot. More than we do. Make a list. Pray for someone new every day of the week or every week. Pray for one another always. Always be praying for one another in the spirit. Pray that God would supply supplication. Pray that God would supply each other all that we need for this battle. And then he says persevere in prayer because the devil is going to convince us not to do it if we don't. Finally, pray that your pastors will preach boldly no matter what. Pray that your pastors will preach boldly no matter what. Verses 19 and 20. Also for me, Paul says, what? That the words may be given to me to do what? Open my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So I'll just apply this to me and, and those who teach you here. When you pray for me, pray for us. Those that teach you the word of God, Pray specifically that I would be bold. Pray like Paul, I would be chained to the gospel. And yes, I know Paul was chained for the gospel, but he meant it in multiple ways. Pray that the Holy Spirit would give me words to say, even when I am talking to you or teaching you, pray for me. Or when I'm counseling you, pray for me. But mostly, As Paul has done here, pray for my boldness. Notice Paul says twice he wants them to pray for him for boldness. We often think, wow, Paul's bold. Why is he asking for boldness twice? And we might, should think, Paul's bold because he asked for them to pray for boldness twice. So why boldness? Because this is war. And the primary means of winning the war for the church is through the bold preaching of the entire council of God. The primary means for winning for the church in this world, for the gospel, 
is the bold preaching of the entire, entire counsel of God's holy word. So pray for me for boldness. You can even add that to your phone reminder if you want. Finally, may we rely on the strength of the Lord. May we stand firm in the means that he has provided for us. May we crush the enemy and have much victory. And may that start and continue because of how we pray. Amen? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I pray very specifically for the people of this church that you would give us eyes to see even as you did Elisha's servant, that you would give us eyes to see that this battle is bigger than flesh and blood, even when many who are flesh and blood are captured in it, that we are in a war, even a war for their souls, that we might stand firm in you by your strength, that we may put on this armor you have given us, and that we may know and love and speak your word, memorize your word, study your word, Teach your word to one another. Because we want to win. We win by your word. As our sword. Help us to pray for one another at all times in the spirit. And Lord, I ask right now that you would continue to give me boldness. For the glory of your name. Amen. Let's sing.